let's nonetheless begin if, if there are any others. It is obviously unpopular, ti unpopular time. Let me uh, just give you two, three more minutes with some explanations. First, although I didn't expect it, I did hear some complaints in the sense of, ah, you communist and charging $20, whatever. Listen, this is poor men's conference. There is no university behind it. There is no good guy like Soros Foundation or whatever. You know, you get that money if you do a conference on starving orphans in Africa, which is a very serious problem, no irony or whatever, victimhood, pro but you don't get that kind of money if the word communism is in, an op in the title, in an obviously positive sense. So to make it absolutely clear, none of us is getting any honorarium Practically all of us, especially the so-called, if I may use this obscene term, big shots, uh, big names, uh, are uh, not getting even travel, hotel, nothing, nothing. And so I hope, again, that $20 wasn't too much for you. That's how it's done when you want to be, you know, again, we charge, and the only, the good guy here are Cooper Union, who gave a good price and were immediately ready, and Verso Books, which invested quite a lot, because your 20, just make a mathematics, doesn't cover the expenses. So just to make this point clear, because I, somebody draw my attention even to a short video spot, writing my name, Slavoj, with cut with dollars, you know, like bad guys. <laughs> the only time this really occurred to me was when I supported Musavi, and an Iranian journalist asked me what should they do. I told them, like Leninist, even if you lose, the important thing is organization, remain organized. Some organized form has to remain. And Iranian friends told me that for one or two days I was the hero, the bad guy for Ahmadinejad gang, the day attacked me as the key coordinator between Musavi and CIA. The time, <laughs> and the time corrupted by CIA. At that point, I must admit, I was tempted to write an open public letter to CIA. Like, I haven't seen any of the big dollars, you know. Here is my bank account, at least. Sorry. More serious. Uh, if some of you were shocked, but I warrant you, by the abstract characters of Frank's excellent talk. I think it was not only a key intervention, but also touched a crucial point in the sense of don't underestimate how in today's ideology work these two categories, possible, impossible. This is the key, I mean, many people of my friends, they even sympathize with communism, but as Frank pointed out, the immediate reaction is, but are you serious? Is this possible? Can we even imagine it? And so on and so on. And again, to repeat an old joke by Fred Jameson, you know, the first step of critique of ideology is just to see how obviously ideologically overdetermined is this opposition possible, impossible. Like without any problem, media are telling us everything is possible in private domains, pleasures, in technology, like in a couple of years we will be able to, to, to grow uh, through uh, cloning uh, uh, ersatz organs, we will become practically mortal, we will travel to Mars, whatever. All that is possible, but you know, to spend a little bit more for healthcare is obviously impossible, no? So uh, these are maybe the crucial, again, ideological categories. And they work, I warn you, in a very tricky way. Now you will say, but for us in the West, nonetheless, we are free to dream. You know, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, I hope you will attack him together with me in what comes, said something which is too cynical, but has a moment of truth in it. He said, the best way to prevent people from being true 
is to make them philosophize and doubt like is is sorry to be free is to make them philosophize is freedom possible at all then you get this endless debate deconstructing freedom are we free and so on so in other words sometimes presenting you the situation as open it's like this but it could have been otherwise is the very way to prevent real change because you know it puts you okay if we want we can change it but let's not do it now. sometimes the best way to solicit change is to present the situation as fixed unchangeable as if this is our fate we can do nothing this truly corners you so here things are much more paradoxical again that sometimes here i would maybe frank supplement you that sometimes the very easy playing with the possibility of change, or it could have been otherwise, is the way to prevent the actual change. And again, don't underestimate the importance of these apparently abstract issues. Now, as I promised you yesterday, if you were too tired with yes, uh, yesterday's abstract issues, here we touch one of the key, I claim, topics where spirits are divided. It's not only in general does ma the traditional Marxist re way of, of relating to religious discourses, does it still hold? Uh, things are really getting interesting, I claim, in the last years. In what sense? Did you notice how in the last years, this is one phenomenon of, what do you say, not more than 10 years, I would say, that atheism has become part of the official public American dialogue. I noticed in some bookstores, you have even a special shelf, atheist studies, and you get all of them, you know, Dawkins, Hitchens, and so on and so on. So where do we stand with regard to religious discourse? Are there ways to for the emancipatory dimension in a religious discourse? If yes, are there limitations to it? I mean, these are brutal questions which, as you know probably better than me, bring up uh, immediately also accusations of cultural imperialism or whatever against Eurocentrism and so on. And what I suspect is that today, but I look with properly Stalinist, masochist pleasure to it, that I will be attacked from the left, as well as, sorry, it's purely physical, from the right. <laughs> so, let's, so let's do it like in doctor's jokes, you know, first bad news, then good news, I hope, and let's start with the right, no? Please, Bruno, we all are waiting for you. <laughs> Um, I'd like to start by um, a brief introduction evoking um, two prior meetings at the Cooper Union. Um, not the Lincoln um, speech that's memorialized on a plaque outside, but a meeting in 1983 that was attended by uh, President Barack Obama and about which um, a, a right-wing journalist has written an otherwise forgettable book it is called Radical in Chief, Barack Obama and the Untold Story of American Socialism. This was taking place across the street in the Great Hall. Uh, it was a meeting of the socialist scholars um, held on April 1st and 2nd in 1983. And it marked, according to this author, the journalist, a, the transformational moment in Obama's career because it turned him into a socialist. He says, over the long term, Obama's plans are designed to ensnare the country in a new socialism stealth socialism that masquerades as a traditional American sense of fair play, a soft but pernicious socialism similar to that currently strangling the economies of Europe. Now, if this is a stealth socialism, then uh, we can only praise President Obama for having pulled a Houdini act in which the socialism has now completely disappeared. But it's nonetheless an interesting uh, account to go back to, uh, and I mention this simply to put it in a longer perspective to suggest that there is a noble tradition uh, around these topics in this very own country um, that might be on the way back. Um, even um, 
the author of Radical in Chief um, promises or threatens with this possibility. He, quotes, he says, the idea that America might inadvertently and incrementally fall into socialism is a great deal closer to the strategies of actually existing socialists than textbook definitions of economies nationalized at a single revolutionary blow. The reason Americans don't understand this is that the universe of post-60s socialism has remained largely hidden from public view. Yet this is Obama's world. It's time we got to know it. I think we can agree that it is perhaps not the president's world, and yet the signs, uh, except perhaps in the eyes of Tea Partiers, but still the promise of some return <coughs> of socialism or communism may be closer today than even a year ago when this book was published. But the 1983 meeting was in turn a celebration for the centennial of the 1883 meeting at the Cooper Union on March 19th, uh, which was a meeting five days after the death of Karl Marx, a meeting attended by uh, Jose Marti, the Cuban writer and independence fighter, who wrote, the international was his work and men of all nations are coming to pay tribute to him. And yet this too, like the first meeting um, in 1983, in some sense was a missed opportunity. Indeed, Marti's chronicle never ceases to respond negatively to the great labor of Marx as a, as a political organizer. Up to half a dozen times, Marti repeats the same reproach that Marx and his followers from the First International seek to accomplish their noble ends with the wrong means. Karl Marx, he writes, studied the means of establishing the world on new basis. He awoke the sleepers and showed them how to cast down the cracked pillars. But he went very fast and sometimes in darkness. He did not see that without a natural and laborious gestation, children are not born viable from a nation in history or from a woman in the home. The other reason for why Marti criticizes the Marx commemoration at the Cooper Union had to do with the differences between the old and the new worlds. Marti believes that Marx and his European followers bring the gospel of class hatred and violent warfare to a country that has enough Republican ideals to be able to do without such violent solutions. And I quote, the future must be conquered with clean hands. The workmen of the United States would be more prudent if the most aggrieved and enraged workmen of Europe were not emptying the dregs of their hatred into their ears. Germans, Frenchmen, and Russians guide these discussions. So now it's even gotten worse because we don't even get Russians, we get Slovenians and Belgians, right? The Americans... The, the lowest you exactly, can get. Exactly, the lowest of them. <laughs> the Americans tend to resolve the concrete matter at hand in their meetings while those from abroad raise it to an abstract plane Good sense and the fact of having been born into a free cradle make the men of this place, the U.S., slow to wrath. The rage of those from abroad is roiling and explosive because their prolonged enslavement has repressed and concentrated it. But a rotten apple must not be allowed to spoil the whole healthy barrel, though it could. The excrescences of monarchy which rot and gnaw at liberty's bosom like a poison cannot match liberty's power. It would take Marti several more years until after the execution of the Haymarket anarchists to completely turn around uh, this verdict. This is in November of 1887, the second chronicle that Marti writes about the Haymarket incident after the execution. This republic in its excessive worship of wealth has fallen without any of the restraints of tradition into the inequality, injustice, and violence of the monarchies. America, then, is the same as Europe. So that the use of violence and what at the time was referred to as red terror may now seem justified. Quote, once the disease is recognized, the generous spirit goes forth in search of a remedy. Once all peaceful measures have been exhausted, the generous spirit, upon which the pain of others works like a worm in an open wound, turns to the remedy of violence. So I mentioned these two uh, prior meetings at the Cooper Union simply to put it in a broader historical context, but also to put it in, in the context of an internationalist dialogue, as I will try to put Karl Marx in dialogue with an Argentine philosopher who passed away last month on September 4th, uh, Leon Rotisner, on the question of Christianity. Now, I have um, three epigraphs that basically sum up um, the argument. The first is from Heidegger, who says, we think the political like Romans, that is, imperially. The second is from Elias Canetti, 
Rome vanquished over Christendom by converting itself to Christianity. Whence the need for 20 centuries of Christianity to give the old and naked idea of Rome a tunica with which to cover up its shameful parts and a conscience for its base moments. There you have it, complete and protected with all the forces of the soul. Who will destroy it? Is it indestructible? Is it precisely its ruin that humanity has conquered with endless fatigue? And now the final quote is the response of the president of the community of Madrid uh, to the protests of young people in Madrid who protested against the visit of Pope Benedict XVI to the World Youth Day um, earlier in the summer of this year. Estos señores que se manifestaban deberían saber que los valores que el cristianismo ha traído a Occidente y al mundo, la igualdad entre seres humanos, la dignidad de las personas, la libertad, la piedad, el sacrificio, el preocuparse por los demás, son todos positivos. Todo lo ha traído el cristianismo, que no se crean que lo ha traído Karl Marx. These gentlemen, like the ones on Occupy Wall Street, who march in protest, should know that the values that Christianity has brought to the West and to the world, the equality of human beings, the dignity of persons, liberty, piety, sacrifice, the concern for others, are all positive. All this has been brought by Christianity. Don't believe it when they tell you that Marx did this. That's interesting. And speaking of the Pope, when he was trying to address the audience in the Barajas airport of Madrid, he leaned over and said, there's something wrong with this mic, to which the whole crowd answered, and with your spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Marx's 1843 text on the Jewish question, though widely anthologized and frequently taught even in the US, is one of those texts that we may have understood all too well. Not only has this text been buried under a mountain of accusations against its author, ranging from charges of Jewish self-hatred to outright anti-Semitism, but even authors such as Daniel Ben Said, who are otherwise wholly sympathetic to Marx's arguments, often see no need to go beyond the plea for a secularization of all theological arguments over and against the current religious turn among radical thinkers of the left and right alike. Marx himself admittedly may seem to be arguing along these lines. He too proposes to bring heaven down to earth, to put the spiritual back on its material base, and to reduce the infinite to the strictly finite. We do not turn secular questions into theological questions, we turn theological questions into secular ones, he writes. History has for long enough been resolved into superstition, but we now resolve superstition into history. However, merely to argue for the secularization of theology misses the whole point of on the Jewish question. Worse, it confuses Marx's argument with that of its principal interlocutor, Bruno Bauer, in the original text called The Jewish Question, the Judenfrage, a title that incidentally we ought perhaps consider translating as the Jewish demand or the demand of the Jews. It is not Bauer, it is Bauer, not Marx, who reasons that Jews in Germany cannot be emancipated so long as they do not emancipate themselves from being Jewish. Thus, Bauer demands, to quote Marx's paraphrase, on the one hand, that the Jews should renounce Judaism and in general that man should renounce religion in order to be emancipated as a citizen. On the other hand, he considers, and this follows logically, that the political abolition of religion is the abolition of all religion. The state which still presupposes religion is not yet a true or actual state. Marx is still only paraphrasing Bauer when he later writes, and I quote, the political emancipation of the Jew or the Christian of the religious man in general is the emancipation of the state from Judaism, Christianity, and religion in general. Clearly, even for the future author of Das Kapital, who will delight in signaling all the theological niceties in commodity fetishism, the argument for the total emancipation from religion cannot suffice. In fact, the abolition of religion risks leaving intact the religious and more properly Christian core of the dominant form of modern politics. That is to say, it fails to touch upon the Christian core of the modern state, as propounded even by Bauer and other young Hegelians, such as Arnold Ruger. In a recent extended reinterpretation of On the Jewish Question, the Argentine philosopher Leon Rotisner has drawn attention to our continuing inability to come to terms with the complexities of this text, 
blinded as most contemporary readers undoubtedly continue to be by Marx's constant use of ironic, not to say sarcastic language. For Rotisner, the point is not just to secularize religion and spirituality in the name of materialism, but rather to travel down the road genealogically to the religious alienation that lies at the root of political and economical alienation. Why else would Marx see the need to pick up the question of religion again if already in the so-called Kreuznach manuscript from the beginning of 1843, he had written that the critique of religion had been completed? Why else would he turn to religiosity when in the same pivotal year he is already moving away from humanist themes such as the freedom of the press in favor of the critique of political economy and other topics of historical materialism such as the polemic unleashed by the question of the theft of wood? It should not come as a surprise that Marx is especially sensitive to the fact that the call for religious self-sacrifice that Bauer proposes to the Jews as a solution to their demand for political emancipation in Germany must have awakened painful uh, personal memories uh, in the young Karl. Upon the recommendation of his father, the latter, after all, had been christened at the age of six. As a Jew turned into a socially acceptable Christian, Marx thus already had traversed half the road toward complete political emancipation in the eyes of Bauer. In Marx himself, though, this experience must have left deep psychic scars. Precisely in a long letter to his father written when he was 19, shortly after arriving at the University of Berlin, Karl Marx would justify his career choice by explaining why he had abandoned the study of law in favor of philosophy, first idealist and then materialist, from the idealism, which, by the way, I had compared and nourished with the idealism of Kant and Fichte, he writes, I arrived at the point of seeking the idea in reality itself. If previously the gods had dwelt above the earth, now they became its center. And yet, even through such a near materialist working through of religion as nature and as history, this loving son never seems to have fully healed from the trauma of his formal conversion to Christianity decided upon by his father. A curtain had fallen, my holy of holies was rent asunder, and new gods had to be installed, he writes in the same letter from November 1837. When Marx returns to the relation of politics and religion in On the Jewish Question, according to Rotisner, he is in part speaking from the painful memory traces left in him by his forced christening. What this experience allows Marx to see is the extent to which there is a Christian foundation that lives on hidden at the very heart of the supposedly modern secular state. This is because the logic of secularization, as in the separation of church and state, so often invoked nowadays with increasing regret in North America, presupposes a prior separation of the private and the public symbolized in the split nature of the human being as man on the one hand and citizen on the other. The real question then does not pertain to the difference between two religions, Jewish and Christian, according to what Bauer in the second text to which Mark responds calls their respective capacities for being free. And I also think in general it's not a question of playing off one monotheism against the other, but rather of questioning the very historical logic of, of the, the, the rise of monotheism. Instead, for Marx, this religious difference is itself nothing more than a displaced version of the division between the private realm in which there exists freedom of religious belief and the public sphere, which is supposed to be the realm of politics proper and in which, as a consequence, religion should no longer have any place. But then, adds Marx, this last division in turn does nothing more than prolong the Christian division of the heavenly and the earthly, the infinite and the finite. Where the political state has attained to its full development, he writes, man leads not only in thought, in consciousness, but in reality, in life, a double existence, celestial and terrestrial. The political state in relation to civil society is just as spiritual as is heaven in relation to earth. What this means is that modern politics, embodied in the so-called rational secular state, continues to be built on the permanence of a form of subjectivity that is profoundly Christian. Or, as Rochester concludes, and I quote, the Christian subjective scission becomes objective and it unfolds itself in that scission within the state. And this is all the more so, not less, when the latter proclaims to be secular. And I quote again, the Christian spirit, subjective, infinite, and imminent, 
which had become objective, finite, and transcendent in the theological Christian state, the Prussian state, has constituted itself into the secular and political basis of the perfect rational secular state, which for Marx um, is the United States. In sum, Marx would blame Bauer for failing to see the extent to which the Jewish question cannot be answered without addressing the Christian question. The Christian state, which still leaves Christianity in existence as an explicit creed, as in the case of Prussia at the time of Marx, has not yet fully perfected the transubstantiation of religion into politics. Paradoxically, this level of perfection is achieved only in the so-called secular state, which Marx associates with the United States of America. And I quote, in the perfected democracy, the religious and theological consciousness appears to itself all the more religious and theological in that it is apparently without any political significance or terrestrial aims, is an affair of the heart withdrawn from the world, an expression of the limitations of reason, a product of arbitrariness and fantasy, a veritable life in the beyond. Christianity here attains the practical expression of its universal religious significance because the most varied views are brought together in the forms of Christianity, and still more because Christianity does not ask that anyone should profess Christianity, but simply that he should have some kind of religion. I think in many states, you cannot be elected politically if you're not a believer in some form of religion. Atheists, apparently, are now a larger or more uh, stringent minority in the US than any other ethnic or racial minority. My wife was telling me that um, Americans are less likely to have their children marry an atheist than any other minority. What Marx proposed to do in on the Jewish question then is at least theoretically to retrace some of the steps that lead up to the paradoxical accomplishment of the Christian spirit in the modern secular state. The political timeliness of this proposal for the present should be obvious enough, provided that we do not fall for the secularization thesis, nor are misled by the accusations of anti-Semitism. But theoretically, too, there are important lessons to be learned from Marx's text. In addition to developing a Marxist theory of the subject, a contemporary reading of On the Jewish Question would require that we also reconstruct a history of modern capitalist as well as pre-capitalist forms of subjectivity. This is something along the lines of what Leon Rotisner himself does in another book called La Cosa y la Cruz, The Thing and the Cross, which offers a close textual reading of Augustine's Confessions as the quintessential manual of subjection of the individual to both the Christian religion and the power of command of the Roman Empire. In retrospect, this is an agenda for theoretical work that following Rotisner, we may find already in Marx's text on the Jewish question, perhaps because Marx derives the task of historical genealogy from his own autobiographical trajectory. Rotisner is quick to add that Marx himself, even later in his mature work, did not bring to fruition the agenda of such a history and theory of political subjectivity. But contemporary Marxists, he, he goes on to say, could not ignore this, as can be deduced from Marxist analysis, when they pretend to transform the consciousness of alienated political subjects by modifying only the economical relations of production without putting into play the mythical determinations of Christianity. Today, there are those who, like Slavoj Žižek, manage to defend Christianity as a legacy still worth fighting for or a cause worth <clears throat> defending. For them, such a fight or such a defense requires a materialist reversal, whereby what otherwise appears to bask in the light of dogmatic truth, all of a sudden shines forth as a fragile absolute summed up in Christ's exclamation on the cross, O oh, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? What this cry symbolizes for Slavoj is the fact that the order of the universe is inherently incomplete or not all. In short, and I quote, with this father hast thou forsaken me, is God, it is God who actually dies, revealing his utter impotence, and thereupon rises from the dead in the guise of the Holy Spirit. Far from simply betraying a momentary lack of faith, Jesus Christ thus highlights the properly revolutionary nature of Christianity in the eyes of Zizek, 
who is a strict follower in this regard of Chesterton when he wrote in his orthodoxy, and I quote, Christianity is the only religion on earth that has felt that omnipotence made God incomplete. Christianity alone has felt that God, to be holy God, must have been a rebel as well as a king. Now I understand, of course, that Slavo is trying to do for Christianity what Freud did for Judaism in Moses and monotheism, um, even at as crucial a time as the imminence of the Holocaust, namely to take away the guarantee of its founding figure. And yet, I believe that, that Slavo here falls short of Freud's insights, who is much clearer about the relations between monotheism and imperialism. Monotheism being nothing more than, as he quote, as he, he writes, a reflection of the needs of imperialism um, for a more abstract monotheistic God in order to spread. At a time when the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan continue to be waged, and people continue to be murdered in places like Norway in the name of the Christian faith, these arguments fail to take into account profound historical complicities, such as the one that, according to Marx, links the rational democratic form of the states to the essence of Christianity. Nor does it suffice merely to abandon the vocabulary of the religious turn if at the same time the very religious and more properly Christian foundations of the modern theory of the subject not only are left untouched, but not, are not even explicitly admitted anymore. As Rochesner writes in his commentary on the Jewish question, we therefore must reach back from political to religious alienation in order to understand the persistence of the religious within the political. We must show that the Christian essence, which critical criticism, you know, the young Hegelians, claims to have overcome, remains and is objectified in the material social relations of the democratic secular state, whose terminal form, as Marx demonstrates, are the United States of America. And we must show, let us add, how it persists to this very day. No form of heterodox orthodoxy, not even when turned towards its perverse core or monstrosity, will suffice to undo the calamitous and unapologetic persistence of this element of Christianity in the modern capitalist, democratic, warmongering state of the so-called West. For all my deep affinity and personal affection for the thoughts presented by thinkers such as Slavo, Jakob Taubes, um, or Cornel West. Why don't you add Alain, but you? I'll, I'll, I'll mention him later. Oh, <laughs> I was trying to not mention his name once. I, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> I believe that the proposal of a Jewish messianism or revolutionary Islam or prophetic Christianity um, uh, to break with the gangsterism of capital is actually a desperate attempt to fight fire with fire. What would be needed then in terms of critique so as to unravel this logic? A long-range genealogy of the history and politics of capitalist subjectivity and the difficulty of finding a communist alternative that would not remain trapped in more of the same. Precisely such a task is taken up by Rotzner in his book, La Cosa y la Cruz, which is, of course, a play on, on Hegel's the, the Rose and the Cross in, in Spanish, la, la Rosa y la Cruz, which uh, Rotzner turns towards um, the, uh, the thing, the Freudian das Ding, la cosa. Right? A good vantage point to understand the importance of this book would involve a comparison between the readings of Augustine's Confessions that you can find in the final work by Jean-Francois Lyotard and Rotisner. The first is a posthumous and unfinished, almost hagiographic testament. The second, Rotisner's, a painfully dense, often repetitive, and occasionally vicious attack. For Lyotard, Augustine's Confessions seem to provide the occasion for an experience of near sublime joy. And I quote, the unencumbered capacity to feel and to enjoy raised to an unknown power that is the saintly joy. Rarely did grace take a less dialectical turn, less negativist and less repressive. With Augustine, the flesh that receives grace accomplishes its desire in innocence. Now, despite sharing an interest in the relation between grace and the flesh, Rossi Snare would have to reject this interpretation almost word for word. Beyond the appearance of sheer innocence and sensuous joy, 
nothing could in fact be more repressive or more negative than the dialectic between death and salvation, or between grace and terror, which Rotisner uncovers in the Confessions. Rather than serving as a substitute love letter, in which the divine Tao comes to stand in effortlessly for the beloved, as is the case for Lyotard, Augustine's text in Rotisner hands thus becomes the target of an incursion into hostile territory, where a declining Roman Empire making a common front with the Christian Church in a world historical juncture best depicted in Augustine's later City of God gives rise to sinister subject formations that prepare the onslaught of capitalism several hundreds of years later. St. Augustine then is not a model, he is the enemy, or at best an anti-model. As Rochesner writes, in his theological libidinal economy uh, that the saint proposes to us from the oldest time, the most productive originary investment to accumulate sacred capital can be found. And I quote, this is a quote from uh, Augustine actually, by hoarding on the flesh, you will invest in the spirit. Rotisner then sums up the bold hypothesis behind his own reading of the Confessions. The Christian spirit and capital have complementary metaphysical premises. Following this hypothesis, we slowly delve into the visceral depths of a subject so as to locate the place where terror and the fear of death from the earliest experience of the child onward become ingrained into the material soul. In fact, without this inscription, for which we can find the user's manual on page after page in Augustine's Confessions, Rotisner claims that capitalism would not have been possible. It needs this docile uh, subject. Theoretically, the core of this argument, which has remained remarkably consistent over the years, is twofold. Combining a thorough investigation into the roots of power and subjection, on the one hand, with a willful retrieval of the collective potential for rebellion and subjectivization on the other. The first theoretical strand allows us in hindsight to posit that terror and grace are actually twin developments, which the critique of subjection therefore cannot treat as separate or mutually exclusive phenomena. For Rotisner, terror derives from the anxiety of death installed into the innermost core of the subject. To, due to the feeling of guilt similar to the one felt over the killing or the wanting to kill the primordial father in Freud's scenario. Grace, however, is merely a false solution or a defense formation in which the origin of power and its extension into the subject's life are covered up or more precisely promised a, an imaginary solution. Today, in fact, Rotisner will claim grace is terror. And he was formulating these arguments well before 9-11, uh, to which he then responded with a book called El Terror y la Gracia, Terror and Grace. In a sense, history always catches up with many of these investigations, uh, which take a look further and further back of the sort of the long durée in history um, to pre-capitalist forms of subjectivity, only to notice that history uh, grabs you from behind. It is not just that terror and grace are said to correspond to two forms of fundamentalism, one supposedly Islamic and the other Christian, competing on the stage of world history today. In fact, Rotisner's investigations into the place of terror in any theory of subjection, as well as his interest in the Christian model of grace, precede by many years the events of the American 9-11 and the ensuing war on terror. But it is also not just a matter, as it seems to be for Badiou and Zizek, of reestablishing the original link between good terror and revolution from the Jacobins to Hegel. Rather, the, unen the unenviable privilege of Rossisner's viewpoint stems from the insight that the regime of terror, that is the military dictatorship in Argentina, extends its reign well beyond the so-called process of national reorganization. The view from the South thus opens up a completely different perspective on the war on terror that was to be unleashed with particular violence in March 2003 during the shock and awe operation in Iraq. In fact, the Chilean 9-11, that is Pinochet's 1973 military coup and the spectacular bombing of the presidential palace of La Moneda in the nation's capital 
in this sense would be instructive of the logic of events surrounding 9-11 in the US. We must come to think through the sinister dialectical link between grace and terror without placing the former as the gift of peace or democracy or civilization that would come after and in response to civil war or dictatorship or fundamentalism. Quote, to understand the pacification, we must first start from the terror that grounds it. War and the dictatorship are terror, but democracy is a grace that the power of terror concedes to us as a truth. Both democracy and dictatorship are two modalities of politics, and they constitute the alternating domain in which social contradictions are fought out. Such would be the sad lesson to be learned from the experience of the military dictatorships, which we now know amounted to the violent imposition of the reign of neoliberalism that was imposed elsewhere with nonviolent uh, or different uh, violent means. The transition to democracy, however, did not mark a break with the underlying logic of terror. To the contrary, the democratic process continues to be grounded in this very logic, only now it is hidden or disavowed. And I quote, the dictatorship from which we come then is not an accident nor an abnormal fact in our political development. Military terror, on the contrary, is part of the same system together with the implicit limits of democracy itself. It constitutes it, its founding and persistent violence. Much less obvious is the answer to the question of what is to be done once the founding violence behind the current political order is exposed. This question stems, the difficulty from this, of this question stems in part from the play of dissimulation through which democracy appears as the epitome of liberty and peace only temporarily interrupted by the abnormality of civil war and dictatorship. Insofar as this game of hide and seek is not accidental but constitutive of the democratic order, the first step necessarily requires an effort at undoing the logic of dissimulation. As Rotisner writes, terror represses the personal place that feeds the impulses for resistance, the collective drives. Because of this, it is necessary to undo this subjective trap, to keep present in order to conjure it the mortal threat that will emerge again when resistance appears. Rossisner goes as far as to suggest that capitalism imposes a diffused shock and awe operation on each and every subject. In the civilized West, no less than in the rest of the world, as witnessed by way of a dark precursor under the military regimes in the Southern Cone. And again, this is long before Naomi Klein's book. On, and I quote from Rotisner, terror denied in political society, but always threatening, corrodes human subjectivity from within. This unconscious fear that runs through society, the terror of death in religion, which it enlivens in the face of rebellion, the terror of unemployment, of bankruptcy, or of poverty in the economy, the terror of the armed forces of repression, the terror of the covering up of those forms of knowledge that we might be able to, un that might be able to unravel this domination, is the ground on the basis of which the system negates within each one the very thing that it animates. Here, however, we also begin to grasp the other rebellious strand in Rotisner's overarching theoretical proposal. His aim is never merely to uncover the originary violence of the political field, but rather to retrieve the potential for rebellion with, with which this violence always has had to come to terms from times immemorial until today. This originary rebellion, for instance, of the child against the father, is precisely the moment that Rotisner seeks to bring to the foreground in his pivotal rereading of the myth of the killing of the primordial father in Freud's so-called collective writings, particularly Totem and Taboo and Civilization and its Discontents. Unlike what happens in certain texts by Agamben or even Slavoj, the killing of the primordial father upon this reading is not meant to produce a radical metaphysics of the state of exception or of the death drive. Beyond the unmasking of originary violence, the aim is above all to put force into the collective subject, 
In other words, if there is a constant effort to reach back and delve into the roots of subjection, the purpose of this return is meant to enable a collective form of emancipatory subjectivization. The real task then consists first and foremost in the ongoing effort to reactivate a possible return to this forgotten origin of subjectivity in rebellion. This is an effort at desfatalization or defatalization, that is, an effort to restore the force of historical possibility by reanimating the event like structure of the process of subjectivization, whose archaic persistence does not preclude the option of reaching out for its effective supersession. Rotisner's book on Augustine, published when the author had already reached the mature age of 73, is an astonishing feat that combines a painstaking close reading with a series of wild speculations. Its claims repeat many of the ideas made in earlier works, all the while anchoring them in the self-proclaimed example of a medieval saint who actually might well turn out to have been the first modern subject. Now, why would an incredulous Jew want to write, Rotisner himself asks from the beginning, about the confessions of a Christian saint? And I might add, why would a communist today, in the midst of worldwide crises and uprisings, begin by talking about the Christian question? Among the various answers, the most audacious one, certainly outdaring Weber's hypothesis about the affinity between capitalism and Protestantism, holds that capitalism simply would not have been possible without Christianity. And I quote, triumphant capitalism, the quantitative and infinite accumulation of wealth in the abstract monetary form, would not have been possible without the human model of religious infinity promoted by Christianity without the imaginary and symbolical reorganization operated in subjectivity by the new religion of the Roman Empire. Augustine is the model of these profound transformations in the psyche economy. His confessions, Rotisner proposes, can be read as a user's manual for subjection and servitude. The complete devalorization of the flesh, of pleasure, and of the social in general together with the newly constituted subject's submission to the rule of law and imperial order constitute the lasting religious premises of the political sphere. Now, to describe the method of his inquiry into the origins of the long historical process of capitalist subject formation, Rosisner frequently uses the verb desentrañar, meaning to disentangle, to unravel, or to clarify but also, literally, to bring up what was embroiled in the entrails or gut, las entrañas. I would argue that this, that this usage, this term, is symptomatic of the author's approach as a whole. Rossi Snare's work indeed presents us with a psychoanalytic investigation into the core of a visceral reason. He uncovers the material, bodily, and affective part of the subject that had to be eviscerated in the name of either a transcendent religion or a purely imminent reason. But only after the power of authority, of the law, and of empire had already been able to impose itself in these very same recesses that subsequently were to have been denied. Augustine interests me, he writes, only for the apparatus of domination and war with which he constructed human subjectivity under the sign of law and truth. This is what continues to be relevant today. Augustine knew how to find the intimate place where power and livens and incites the emotions and fires up the most sinister fantasies in order to put the body in action and at this terrible hour when the old world collapses to yoke it to the war chariots of political and economical power. This is Rochester writing about Augustine before the war on terror. Along the path of this investigation, we obtain not only a detailed picture of how the subject, prior to becoming the flesh and father of capitalist accumulation, first had to become the subject of law at the time of the Christian Roman Empire's imminent disaster, that is, the sack of Rome that will mark the immediate reference point for Augustine's political theological treatise, City of God. But we will also find a daring series of comparisons between Christianity and Judaism, as well as a powerful suggestion 
to supplement for its own doctrine of Oedipal guilt and the super-ego law with the interpretation of the theory of the subject derived from Christianity. If we take this human model, Rotisner writes, or Augustine's model, considered to be the most sublime, and if we show that there, in the exaltation of the most sacred, the commitment to what is most sinister also finds a niche, will we not also in doing so have uncovered the obscene mechanism of the Christian religious production? This is the challenge, to understand a model of being human that has produced 16 centuries of subtle and refined, brutal and merciless subjection. 